Those of us humans who are Hindus believe that people should not lie, cheat, steal, or kill. Here are some representations of Vishnu, who is the Hindu supreme being or soul, the essence of all beings, and the creator, sustainer, and destroyer of all beings and of everything in the universe. In his book, Our Religions, Avrin Sharma describes Hinduism as a philosophical, spiritual, and experiential system. It is a method for discovering spiritual truths. Hinduism is more a way of ethical life than a school of thought. It gives no restrictions on thought, but has a strict code of behavior. Hinduism is tolerant and accepts all other religions as true. There is no heresy hunting in Hinduism. Hindus believe that religion is universal and are displeased when another religion tries to make its particular brand of religion universal. Namaste. Hindus believe that religion is not correct belief, but correct behavior. Hinduism is also separate from a state. Hindus wonder how a religion could use a state as an instrument of its expansion. Hinduism does not want to convert all humanity to a single belief. Instead, it wants to convert everyone's conduct into proper form. Hindu religion consists of daily behaviors and is practiced during interactions with family, friends, neighbors, and strangers. Hindus do not congregate in a public church building. Instead, each home has a shrine and there are small shrines in every neighborhood. In the Hindu religious tradition, Thomas Hopkins explains that within one Hindu family, mom might be a devout worshiper of Shiva, a son is equally devout but follows the teachings of Ramakrishna, and dad worships Krishna. The family visits a temple of the goddess Durga. They visit a temple and teaching center dedicated to Vishnu, and they sing devotionals to Krishna. Similarly, Every other family has its own mixture of practices. The collection varies throughout Hindu lands and through the centuries. There are many equally valid paths to reach the same goal. Each person chooses the path that best suits themselves at each point in life. No one thinks that there is only one correct path that must be learned verbatim and followed by all. The milestones of life ends with death and begins with birth. Puberty transforms a young person into an adult and a Hindu as seen in the ceremony. Marriage is a milestone in life. Each person is living in one of life's stages, has a certain place in family and society, and has duties to fulfill in everyday life. This is dharma, or the proper way in life, and it differs somewhat from one person to another. It is all of those things that ought to be done to maintain the order and harmony of the universe. 
there is a parallelism between ritual order, cosmic order, and the order of society. Actions in society are also ritual and cosmic actions. Ritual actions can be done mentally. The primary responsibility of most persons is to raise a family and maintain a household within society. The preservation of society greatly depends on the householders. There are several incarnations of Vishnu, including Krishna and Buddha, who arrive when needed to restore failing righteousness. For many Hindus, the supreme being is Vishnu, or Brahma, who is the creation, or Shiva, or Krishna, or all of them, or these plus Devi, who is the female aspect of the divine, and Surya, who is light and the sun. Other deities include Ganesha, who is the beginning of a new enterprise or undertaking and the removal of obstacles. Durga is the invincible warrior goddess. Saraswati is learning, academic, and divine knowledge, arts, and the sacredness of the river. Lakshmi is food, royal power, universal sovereignty, knowledge, power, holy luster, kingdom, fortune, bounteousness, and beauty. Kali is eternal energy and the force of time. Vayu is breath. Indra is rainfall, storm, and war. Agni is the power in fire, who also exists within objects until released in a ritual fire. In the Hindu view of life, Radhakrishnan explains that each Hindu is free to make his or her own conclusions about deities, deciding for themselves the number and reality of the gods. He or she may decide that there is one supreme god, many gods, or no god at all. There is no limit on intellectual beliefs for the simple reason that there is only one reality. It just has many names and vases. Notice that no two Christians have an identical idea of Christianity. Each Hindu chooses the kind of god or gods that he or she wants to worship, along with the spiritual method they think is appropriate for that worship. Hindus are not the chosen people, but the choosing people. One Hindu scholar said that there are 3,306 Hindu deities, but they are all one Brahman or universal substrate. The representations of gods do not tell us what god is, they only tell us what god is to us. The infinite supreme being cannot be described in everyday terms. It is beyond our imagination. Our world does not exist independently of its ultimate cause, the supreme being. Hindu scholars debate whether God is separate from the universe. If the universe is part of God, if God chose to be transformed into the universe, or if God is more than the universe. Samkara scholars deny the reality of our temporary and finite world because it is not independent of its ultimate cause. That is, it does not independently exist on its own, but is a collection of other parts. Since each possible answer about God brings many other questions, it is unlikely that we can logically deduce the answer. Radhakrishnan says that since each postulate about his characteristics leads to logical inconsistencies, agnosticism would be wiser. We cannot rest in the idea that the absolute is incomprehensible, but the supreme being cannot be both infinite and comprehensible. Some Hindus believe in an infinite god, while others believe in a personal god. Some worship ancestors and deities, while others worship forces and spirits. This covers the entire spectrum, from the power in the bush to the power of the sun and of the supreme being. Some Hindus believe that the deities live in the water and sacred rivers. Others see them in the heavens and still others see them inside themselves. Hinduism has been developing and adding new doctrines for 3,000 years. It has no single historical founder, but many prophets and a mosaic of doctrines. Hindus work, worship, pray, and seek well-being in this world and the next for themselves, and for their family and friends. 
Hinduism is an array of techniques for establishing links between the human world and the transcendental world beyond it. The path to the realm is characterized by the reasons behind your actions rather than the benefits of your actions and is rooted in egolessness. Radhakrishnam explains that the sacred epic tales or Vedas describe proper moral conduct. They contain the spiritual experiences of historical persons whose souls were more strongly endowed with the sense of reality. There are three parts to the Vedas. As the Upanishads tell the experiences of the sages. The Brahma Sutras logically interpret the conclusions of the Upanishads, and the Bhagavad Gita describes how to attain the truly religious way of life. The Hindu attitude toward the Vedas is trust with criticism. They trust that what was useful for their parents will also be useful for themselves. They are critical because all generations must ask their own questions and make their own conclusions. Hindus feel that if a religion stops growing, then its adherents have become spiritually dead. Dogma is subordinate to experience, and outer expression is less important than inward realization. Hinduism is a kind of life experience and an insight into the nature of reality. It is not an emotional thrill or an acceptance of academic abstractions. It relies on the labor of being religious rather than on a mechanical acceptance of an authority's version of religion. Blind belief in dogma is not faith. Two important Hindu principles are respect for all humans and devotion to truth. All of the people of the planet are God's offspring. They all have the same religious goal but achieve God realization in different ways. For this reason, Hindus recognize all religions to be valid. This has been part of their tradition since its early days. About 3,000 years ago, Hinduism united the many people of the Indian subcontinent. It also kept peace by assigning each new group a place in the caste hierarchy. It united many different tribes of peoples, each having their own ancient deities. It also united tribes who believed in a single, omnipotent god. Radha Krishnan explains that in feudal society, warriors are the most important persons, while in capitalistic society, it is the money makers. In Hindu society, cultural artists and spiritual persons are more important than those who pursue economic matters. The persons of highest regard are those of self-sacrifice and devotion to the world. They are called Brahman. The Brahmins see themselves as a part of the whole and would rather die than act against others. You become a Brahmin by doing good deeds. There are divine potentialities in even the worst persons, and we retain the power within us to raise ourselves. We are born with a large number of characteristics, but choose which ones to use. Karma is the idea that many of our characteristics can be traced to our past. The worst sinner has a future just as the greatest saint has had a past. The past does not determine the future, but only conditions its development. God has not planned the details of our future. Show charity for sinners because they are merely weak. They are not evil or wicked of heart. The descent into hell is easier than the steep ascent into heaven. Hindus do not believe in a hell because there cannot be a place where God is not. It doesn't matter if you have this view or that. It only matters that you perform good by being kind, honest, grateful, and sympathetic. Wealth and power are natural desires, but must be obtained righteously. Fulfilling the spirit is more satisfactory than fulfilling the desires for wealth and power. The fact that the goals of our hearts do not perish with this body inspires one to live with a present sense of eternity. Each individual possesses knowing, feeling, and willing. Each of our acts is weighed by God's justice. The day of judgment is not in the future, but in the present. God put natural laws into the universe and moral laws into our soul. Sin is a denial of our soul, not a defiance of God. God also expresses his justice with forgiveness. Guilt is atoned by sorrow. Prayer cannot be used to obtain your every desire. Humans have four goals. A moral life, the earning of wealth, enjoyment of the pleasure of the senses, and the seeking of liberation. In, for example, a hundred year lifespan, we should spend the first 20 years learning morality and vocation. 
During this time, a plastic youth becomes molded into a person capable of duty. During the next 25 years, we earn wealth and enjoy sensuous pleasures. We create the perfect marriage through hard work. Divorce is a confession of defeat and is done too often in today's hurried life. Through the next 25 year portion of life, we should live a virtuous and pious manner while we slow down to ponder higher problems in our own soul. Our soul makes us more than our possessions and social position. What do we gain if we own the entire world but lose our soul? Materialism falsely claims to bring a better life. We seek liberation in the remaining 25 years while we attain a state of spiritual freedom, untempted by riches or honors. At any moment in a person's life, he or she is one of these stages of life, pursuing our particular goal consistent with one's humanity as expressed in universal values such as charity, purity, and virtue. Devotion through prayer, petition, fasting, sacrifice, communion, and self-examination, along with wisdom obtained through realized experience, are concurrent paths to God. Radhakrishnan described that thanks to science, the world was becoming a much smaller place, and that we are realizing that everyone in the world is a member of a single cooperating group. He wonders how some religions will be able to live together, and says that we cannot have religious unity as long as some assert sole positions of truth. The political idea of the world is not one empire with a homogeneous society and a single communal will. It is a fellowship of free nations that differ profoundly in life and mind. The just organization of the world's societies will be based on political equality, economic fraternity, and spiritual liberty. There is no hope for our world unless there is a fellowship of our religions. As in Hinduism, the religions of the world should seek unity in moral conduct rather than unity in sect. The world would be much poorer if one sect absorbed the rest. God wants diverse harmony, not colorless uniformity. All religions curb excess and promote ethics. He is confident that Hinduism's tolerance of others is the answer to the conflict of religions. He points out that Jesus did not say that it is wicked to be Jewish. He didn't tell other people to drop their bad religion and accept his. In 1927, Radhakrishnan says that the government was made to protect us from the overly greedy business person, but today's money-making obsession has erupted into an uncontrolled greed that has never before been seen. The love of wealth is disrupting social life and suppressing the spiritual. Greed is the cause of much of the world's meanness and cruelty. Working people deserve more comfort for their role in providing both the labor and the market for the industrialists. He says that the workers should receive the highest wages because their work is their only reward. Thinkers and advisors should be paid the least because these actions are reward enough in themselves. Radhakrishnan also warns nations not to view others as inferior. Julius Caesar had such insults for the uncivilized, animal-skin-dressed savages of Europe, and then 400 years later, they sacked his capital. The political and military leadership of a region is always temporary. All people contribute to our thought, moral advancement, and spiritual growth. All peoples will develop to their full potential in due course. All people show considerable ingenuity when pressed by external forces. Today's less industrialized nations will choose to create capitalistic industries and economies whenever they have a need to do so. These things do not make people any happier. The industrialized nations can't see how others can be different from them. Even in the last 200 years, the superior nations have performed a long list of atrocities in Asia, Africa, and America. Civilization is not the suppression of less industrialized peoples. God does not give any group the right to destroy or enslave others. Our highest ideals require that we give every group its own future. The greatest Hindu heroes are those who tried to bring together the different peoples of India into a more just society. It is much more difficult to fight injustice than it is to fight soldiers. This is the reason that Gandhi and Martin Luther King are great heroes in our world today.